I'm Tina Oldno. I'm the curator of Modern Glass at the museum. And I was so pleased this morning to see how many new members uh, uh, are visiting seminar. It's really um, very exciting. And I thought maybe I should do a little, a bit of an introduction to the Reykjavik Commission, which is what I'm going to be talking to you uh, about now. Um, the Reykjavik Commission is an annual commission of the museum. It was inaugurated in 1986 by the Corning, uh, by the, um, the Corning Museum of Glass. The Reykjavik Commission supports new works of art in glass. Um, it was made possible through the generosity of the late Dr. and Mrs. Leonard A. S. Raykow, the same people who our Raykow Library is named after. They were fellows, friends, and great benefactors of the museum. Each commissioned work is added to the museum's collection, and it is displayed publicly for the first time during seminar, so you will be seeing it um, at, after the reception upstairs, during the reception. The Raykow Commission encourages artists working in glass to venture into new areas that they might otherwise be unable to explore because of financial limitations. And over the years, recipients have ranged from emerging to established artists. Uh, when I came in 2000, I decided to give myself a few more parameters on the Raykow Commission because it was originally, uh, it was inaugurated at a time when there were not that many people working in glass. And artists working in glass have increased exponentially over the past 30 years, uh, which is great. But I decided to make it a little harder for myself. The um, Reykjavik Commission would have to be an artist who is not yet represented in the collection, an up and coming artist, professional artist, not yet represented in the collection. So um, this means that sometimes I have to go a little bit to the, the fringes. Um, but we do have a very uh, interesting group of people that we've managed to put together. I'm very pleased to introduce you to the 2010 Raykow Commission artist, who is the British artist Luke Jerram. Although Luke is not with us physically tonight, he will be speaking to us. How, you say, can he be speaking to us? Well, we're going to follow the news organizations, and he will be speaking to us via Skype. Um, this is a test run of this technology for the museum. And if it's, if it's successful, it will create new opportunities to make connections with artists and scholars who would otherwise be un unavailable to speak to us. After Luke's presentation, there will be some time to ask him questions. Um, I nominated Luke Jerram for the 2010 Raykow Commission because I wanted to mark the museum's 25th commission with an artwork that made reference to art history and to science. These two fields of inquiry have constituted the intellectual core of operations at the museum since its opening in 1951. Luke describes himself as a colorblind installation artist who fuses his artistic sculptural practice with scientific and perceptual studies. He creates sculptures, installations, soundscapes, and public art projects that investigate how the mind works, particularly in connection with perception and reality. Luke's approach to art making is multidisciplinary, and he uses whatever materials are most appropriate to realize his ideas. His work is inspired by his research in the fields of biology, acoustic science, music, sleep research, uh, ecology, and neuroscience. His projects, which have garnered much media exposure, range from placing upright pianos in outdoor locations in cities around the world for the public to make music, uh, entitled Play Me, I'm Yours, to studying the effect of sound on dreams, dream director, to the creation of a wind pavilion, Aeolus. For the Reykjavik Commission, Luke created two flameworked and blown glass sculptures of the smallpox virus and HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, from his glass microbiology series. When you look at the case, uh, when, you look, when you see the art object in the galleries, the smallpox virus is on the left and the HIV on the right. In this series, Luke explores the tension between the beauty of his sculptures, the deadly viruses that they represent, and the global impact caused by these diseases. He says, the smallpox vir virus celebrates the 30th anniversary of the global eradication of this major disease and the HIV represents humanity's current worldwide struggle. For the Glass Macrobiology Project, Luke worked with virologist Andrew Davidson to research the physical structures of the viruses, taking inspiration from high-resolution electron microscopic images 
and scientific models. And with the help of scientific glass blowers, he created scientifically accurate depictions of notorious viruses and bacteria, such as HIV, E. coli, SARS, and recently H1N1. Scientists and artists start by asking similar questions about the natural world, Luke says. They just end up with completely different answers. Luke earned his BA from the School of Art and Design at the University of Wales Institute in Cardiff in 1997, and he has participated in numerous international exhibitions since that time. He has received important grants and awards in the United Kingdom for his wide-ranging projects, including an Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council grant in 2009, an Arts and Humanities Research Council Fellowship in 2005-2006, and the prestigious three-year National Endowment for Science, Technology, and Arts Fellowship, or NESTA, in 2002. In addition to his independent studio practice, he is currently a research fellow at the University of Southampton. Luke, are you there? Hello. <laughs> Luke, go ahead. go ahead and start your presentation. Well, I just thank you very much first. I mean, it's amazing uh, to be here. Um, uh, thank you for the, you know, the amazing award. Uh, this, um, this commission is, is such a, a privilege to have, you know, uh, and to be the, you know, in a line of artists over the years uh, is, is, a, is a real privilege. And it, it's really, really good. I'm really excited. And uh, this isn't going to be an interesting way to give a presentation, isn't it? This is the first time I've worked in this way. And um, how, how is my image looking? Is it all right? I'm a bit too pixelated. Do I look a bit bright? No, you're looking OK. You're looking OK. I'm looking OK. Good. Yeah. You're looking good, 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 good. Well, um, I'm going uh, to talk for about sort of 20 minutes. And I just hope that if perhaps if you can't hear me, then you have to wave frantically. Because actually what I can see, I can see everyone one from the back of the auditorium, so I can just see everybody's heads. Maybe if everyone could turn around and wave, then I can wave back. Oh, there you are. Oh, there we go. Hey, it's like a crowd. This is good we can have a Mexican wave. Um, so, uh, the wonderful technician Scott is able to, uh, has got a slideshow, but it basically uh, my website, which we can um, start to, to think about showing. So the first artwork I was going to talk about, I mean, I do a whole variety of different projects. Some are uh, very large and some are very small. I realized, I realized a long time ago that, um, that lots of my friends and relatives never really saw or appreciated the art that I, that I was making because I was always exhibiting it in a different city or in a different country. So I started making artworks for, for the people I love. And I made this um, first one. This is a talking engagement ring. Let's see if, if this... Uh, Slideshow will work. Here we go. There we go. So this this is my um, this is the engagement ring I made for my wife, um, and it's actually got my voice, my proposal etched onto the outside of it. So it's my my message of love, my proposal, and I proposed to her in a hot air balloon over Bristol, and um, you can actually play the ring back on this miniature record player. So to make this, I work with a, a vinyl record manufacturer, and I worked uh, with a jeweler. I mean, this is generally what I do. I build teams of people to make projects happen. Uh, and it's very nice working with different specialists. Um, and it, it, it also means that anything is kind of possible. Uh, and of course, once I've made this engagement ring, I couldn't then just go out and buy, the, buy a wedding ring. So I had to then make a, make a wedding ring as well. So if we have the next slide, then that will be... Um, so this, this is my wedding ring, and this has got images of my, my family, my daughter and, and us, um, and it actually projects portraits. So you hold up the, the ring to a candle or a little LED, and um, it projects pictures of us. And the idea is that you could actually replace those slides um, and as we added more children to the family. You know, keep it up, up to date um, and it was made yeah by working with a jeweler uh, but I, I took apart lots of um, 
old disposable cameras just to find the right lens, the perfect lens that would be embedded into that. Uh, so that was quite fun. Uh, oh, this was a nice one. I made something called a meteorite catcher. Um, uh, I, I made this for a friend who plays the lottery, and I, I found out that actually you're more likely to be hit by a meteorite than you are to win the national lottery. So I made this for them. Uh, so when they lose on a Wednesday, they could um, hold, this, hold the meteorite catcher out of the window and have another chance of winning something. Um, Oh, and uh, finally, one, one more little fun project. This is a, a meter, uh, this is a, a miracle toaster. So you, uh, you put your bread in your toaster and you, you get a, a picture of the Virgin Mary on every single piece of it. <laughs> this was to kind of celebrate those, uh, those objects, you know, around the world. I think, you know, where people, people might travel for a thousand miles to see a giant home plate and they go and pray to them. Well, I think there's a bagel, actually. There's a bagel in the shape of Mother Teresa. Can you, um, hear, can you hear everyone clapping for you? Yeah, <laughs> see that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of fun to be had, you know. Uh, and it's nice to share, you know, my creativity in different ways with different people. Um, uh, so one of the projects that people may have heard of uh, is an art project called Play Me, I'm Yours. Uh, and this artwork has seemed to have taken over a good chunk of my life at the moment. I, I basically put pianos on the, on the street for people to play. So in New York recently, we put 60 across all five boroughs of New York. Uh, and then we just, there's the words on them, play me on yours. So that's a sort of invitation for the, for the public to engage with the project. Um, but I've put something like 300 pianos in 17 different cities over the last two years. Uh, it's all got a bit out of hand. Now there's another 60, no, 75 cities interested in the project. Um, there's a website where everyone uploads their films and photos and stories and, and comments. Um, uh, and it's very, yeah, I mean, the public, the public just have an amazing time. Uh, uh, it's, it's quite something to behold. Um, so that, yeah, that takes up a lot of my time. But again, you know, to, to deliver a project like this involves building teams, really, of uh, piano tuners, piano technicians, um, project managers. Uh, I put, you know, that photograph there is a, a, a photograph of a uh, piano in Sao Paulo. I put pianos in Sao Paulo where people there, lots of people there have never actually seen a real piano before, uh, let alone have the opportunity to play one. I came across a mother and daughter in that train station just there on that picture. And uh, the mother had worked as a cleaner for four years to be able to send her daughter to piano lessons on the other side of the city. And, um, and after four years of working as a cleaner, she'd never actually heard her daughter play the piano because a piano over there costs about $1,000, a year's wage for lots of people. And so, um, yeah, she'd never actually heard her daughter play, and she sat down, the girl sat down and played for the first time with some beautiful piano for her mum, who burst out into tears, you know. It was, uh, it's quite, quite a moving, quite a moving moment. There's two, you know, two journalists who met over a piano in, in Sydney, where I put one, and uh, they fell in love, and they invited me to their wedding last week. So that was quite a well. So it's the power of art, fine thing. Um, but yes, I suppose I'm, uh, I've got this natural interest in, in perception. And this is partly because I'm colorblind. So the way in which I see the world is different to other people, I suppose. I'm red-green colorblind, so, but it just makes me very skeptical and, and distrustful, I suppose, of <clears throat> the use of color in images. And uh, I'm interested in imagery and, and how the eye works and exploring the edges of perception. Um, so the, the first project here is Retinal Memory Volume. And uh, this was an artwork that kind of kick-started my career back in, uh, in, what was it, 1997. So I've been out of college 13 years now. Um, light passes through a stencil, and it, it goes through a stencil and into your eye, and it makes an afterimage. You know when you look at a bright light, uh, and you get this sort of patch of color in your eye? Well, this installation, it works in the same way. And you I can actually build objects inside people's heads 
using uh, these retinal after images, these flashes of light that come and build up images in your, in your retina. Um, and so I suppose I've been exploring this, this, this idea of perception for, for about 10 years now. Um, the next art project is called Tide. But what I generally do is, when I've learned something from an art project, I would throw out everything, throw out, I'd rebuild, think through the language again, and throw out everything I'd learned and start again. I, I want artwork to challenge me, I want, I, want to make, I want to challenge myself all the time. So this is why a lot of the artworks I make look quite different to one another. This is an artwork controlled by the moon. In Bristol, we've got the highest tidal range in Europe. Uh, something like 14 meters between high tide and low tide. And I wanted an artwork controlled by the moon. So I used a gravity meter uh, to pick up the pull of the moon. And then that controlled water levels in these glass bowls that you can see. Uh, and the, the glass bowls are then spinning. And there's a friction device on the top that makes them sing like a finger on a wine glass. So they're, they're all singing away, and the pitch changes with the, with the water levels, the tidal levels. So it works like a giant astronomical clock, really. And that artwork is sort of toured all over the world. Um, but it's also, it made me realize that, it's, you know, the idea of mixing electricity with water and moving parts, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> so it, has a tend it does tend to have a tendency to break down sometimes. Um, so this is why I moved to putting pianos on the street, which is far easier. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the next project is called Sky Orchestra. Um, so this is the this is the idea. I mean, this idea came from <clears throat> this idea came from visiting Tunisia. I was staying in the desert in Tunisia, and um, at about three in the morning minarets started calling around the city and it just lifted me into this space on the edge of sleep it was a very beautiful moment um, I was lying in my hotel room it was dark and then you could hear the minaret calling right on the edge of the city and the dust and the heat in the air was absorbing the sound and, um, and a few minutes later another minaret started on the other side of the city and then a few minutes later, then there was another. So after a while, there was about 10 minarets calling right around the city. It was a very beautiful moment. And it, the sound just lifted me into this space on the edge of sleep. And I could almost see the layers of sound building on top of one another. It was very beautiful. And a map of the town seemed to open up in my head. Um, and the experience was quite powerful. And I, I came back to Bristol. And I wanted to sort of share that experience with other people. And so I had this idea, well, why don't we uh, play music to affect people's dreams and to lift them into that space on the edge of sleep, and then to, to deliver that music? Well, we'll strap speakers onto hot air balloons. So that's kind of what we do. So we, we put speakers on hot air balloons, uh, and each balloon plays a different part of the musical score. And it, we take off about six or seven in the morning when everyone's sleeping at home. And the idea is we fly over a city to affect people's dreams and just lift them into that space on the edge of sleep and deliver music in surround sound. And it's a very beautiful, uh, beautiful experience for people. Um, I had a few death threats, but only, from, <laughs> but only from people in Texas. Uh, uh, you know, this was from a flight that we did in England, by the way. You know, the press kind of got, get hold of these things. And they, they seem to go with it. Um, I'm wondering if you if you scroll down a little bit on the web page, there's a film there that you might want to think about playing. I don't know whether there, there's audio on on that, um, whether that will work or not. Who knows? There's definitely audio on the film. Oh. So, as it, as it stands, we'll take off from here um, and go with the schedule as we were talking about with, uh, what is it, 621, 621, I think we launched. You blokes are all balloon pilots, so you always like to get on the stage and, and sort of perform, or well, today's your day. So, get yeah. ready for it. Hey.
Okay, I think that's probably enough of that. <laughs> that's amazing. So, wait a minute, I haven't finished. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's that particular art project. And curiously, the, um, uh, we tried to fly in 2000 and, uh, 2007 in Birmingham. And we wanted live musicians in the balloons with their violins. And we had the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. And we all turned up to play in Birmingham. And, uh, and the Met Office had got their weather predictions wrong. And it was a complete nightmare. We, we couldn't fly because it was too windy. And uh, we had to pay all the musicians because they were on music union rates. Um, we had to pay all the pilots for turning up. So we'd spent maybe $20,000 on an artwork that hadn't sort of performed. It was a complete disaster. But, uh, and we'd also promised to the city council in Birmingham that we'd reach 100,000 people with an artwork in three weeks. So I had to quickly think of a new artwork that would reach 100,000 people in three weeks. And, and the Street Pianos project was that artwork. So actually from the complete despair and concern came a new artwork that has actually been far more successful uh, than the Sky Orchestra anyway. Um, the, the, next, the next project, before I start talking about glass, is my Aeolus Acoustic Wind Pavilion. Um, so this is a... Uh, Again, this, is a, this was experienced by, inspired by a trip to Iran. I went to Iran and I spoke with a desert well digger. These are people who dig wells out of, out of sand. And um, uh, he talked about how the, how the wells would sometimes sing and howl in the wind. So I decided to try and make a building that would sing in the wind. And I've been working on it for about three years now. Uh, and it's turned into this, this artwork. So it's like an arch that you can walk in underneath. Uh, the, the tubes are mirrored on the inside. Which, and so at different times of day, the, the light um, you know, gets drawn through these tubes and you get a different experience. Strings are attached to the tubes as well, which you probably can't see on those photographs. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Um, uh, the whole building sings. It's a giant Aeolian wind harp. Uh, and we've got money to do this, and we're building it in the next couple of months, and it's going to tour the UK next year, and may end up at the Olympics in 2012 in London. So it hasn't yet been built. All, all these are little Photoshop mock-ups. Um, but it's quite an exciting time. This is the first time I'll have made something really big. Uh, with a really big budget. It should be a lot of fun. Um, so going on finally to my glass work. Um, this has been a quite of an interesting kind of journey. Again, this, this artwork came about through my interest in perception. I was interested in, in thinking about sort of global epidemics. And I think the first artwork I made was HIV, a small glass sculpture. Um, and I made it really just to sort of think about it. Do you want to open up the, the web page? There we go. Uh, so I, I made these glass sculptures, one sculpture, just to sort of think about really and contemplate. And it made me realize that actually there's lots and lots of images that you see in magazines and, um, and journals. You know, when you see a, a, an image of a virus in a newspaper, often it's brightly colored. Whereas actually, viruses are too small to hold any color at all. They're actually smaller than the wavelength of light. So that was another reason why I made these things. Um, so in newspapers, they, they seem to be brightly colored and sort of toxic uh, or very pretty. You know, There's an emotional content. So you add color to images, there's an emotional content that gets added to it. So this is why I made these sort of three-dimensional uh, versions of the glass as a kind of response to that, I suppose. What I, what I discovered was that often with an electron microscope, a, a scientist might take an image of a, a virus with an electron microscope, and they, they would then give those images to an organization like a science photo library in London, who would then Photoshop them up. They would add color to them, because their job as, in, as a library would, would be to sell them to journalists. And a journalist would phone up, and they'd say, OK, I want some. Um, healthy looking bacteria please for my article on healthy uh, healthy bacteria and the the journal you know the library says, oh you need the green and white 
images. Uh, they look healthy. They would use those for the newspaper. Uh, all the journalists would say, okay, we want some dangerous looking bacteria, uh, please. And uh, they're, oh, well, you need the purple and yellow ones. You know? um, so this sort of emotional content is added. And yet when you look in a newspaper, there's a, there's a sense that, that what you're looking at is truthful. There's a sense of sort of scientific uh, objectivity about it. Um, and so these sculptures are meant to add uh, another voice. They add to an, another interpretation, I suppose, of the same, of the same data. Um, and they're made through looking at uh, images of viruses in an electron microscope, but also looking at uh, diagrams uh, and models. And I work with a virologist uh, at the University of Bristol. And I also work with, with a, a team of glass blowers. So for me to make these sculptures would take about 20 years to learn to do that. So by working with a team of glass sculptures, uh, glass sort of specialists, we've been working on these since yeah, 2004. And, and it's, been a, it's been a wonderful journey, actually. We started off making some incredibly, you know, quite small, quite simple artworks. And gradually over the years, we've been able to make more and more complicated sculptures. Um, and sometimes I'm coming up with diagrams that, and they say, look, we just can't build this. This, is, this isn't, this isn't going to hold together with the forces of gravity. It's far too fragile. Um, interestingly, that colored image that you see there, um, that I, I, I sold one of these sculptures to the Wellcome Trust in London. And their photographer took it, took an image of it, and added lots of colour, which is really <laughs> annoying. And he then was given a, a photographic award from the Institute of Medical Imaging for for the best, you know, image of a virus or something. And it just uh, it just goes to show the power of colour. But it, it uh, yeah, it's just slightly annoying. <laughs> Not much I can do about it. Um, uh, so I've got a basic understanding of, of, of glass blowing, but I don't make these glass sculptures myself. The, the, the sculptures are, are, are signed; they're signed by me. But I also make sure that the, the glass blowers are also they sign them as well, and that's really important as well. So um, uh, they get a credit, and also they get to see. You know, they can send their grandkids down to the museum and, uh, and show their grandkids the artwork they made, and that's quite nice as well. Um, the, the glass team, it's interesting that in the, in, certainly in England, at one point every university would have a, uh, a chemistry department that would, be, that would also have a glass department attached to it. Um, so the glass blowers would be making distilleries and test tubes and all the scientific glassware you need. And what's happened is over the last, sort of, I don't know, 30 years or so, all these uh, glass departments of chemistry I've just closed down. They now, uh, well, they don't use as much glassware, but they also just import glassware from China. And you might have one glass technician who his job would be to kind of literally glue the bits together that were pre-made. So there's a lot of glass blowers going out of work, and um, it's a kind of dying art form, really, certainly in the UK. So it's quite nice to work with these guys, uh, and they spend their time making dodgy glass boats in bottles uh, for sort of Hong Kong uh, tourist industry. And they're actually quite glad to, to make sort of sculptures for me as well. So um, that's kind of how it works. Uh, it's a curious one. Uh, but it's actually very common in the art world. That's generally uh, often what happens is you, you get established at something and then um, or you think about Andy Warhol and his, and his factory, or there's Damien Hirst. It's actually happened since the beginning of the art uh, era. You would have Poussin. I know Poussin would have had one artist who was specialized in clouds. He, one artist to come and do the clouds, and you have another artist to come and do the leaves of the trees, another artist to do the people. And Poussin would have a, uh, a studio uh, uh, that would, of all these artists, working on his paintings. And uh, it's quite nice to work in, in teams. In fact, I've got one sculpture here. There we go. So this is, uh, or if we can hold that up. There we go. So this is a sculpture of um, swine flu. Um, 
uh, that's, that was made recently. You see it better against a black background. There we go. And it's got all the, um, the RNA and the, um, the sort of, um, all the, yeah, all the proteins on the outside. So you've got all the proteins on the outside, and the proteins act as kind of keys to open up the cell. When, when this virus meets a cell wall, the, the, the um, proteins act as keys to unlock that cell. Uh, and then all the genetic material inside opens up and replicates within the cell. Uh, and they carry on going. So this sculpture has just come back from uh, the Mori Museum in Tokyo. Uh, and I was exhibiting it along with artworks by Damien Hirst and Andy Warhol and Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, that's quite cool, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, that's kind of where we are. Um, I've just finished a malaria sculpture, which you can see on this, uh, on this slideshow. And that's going to be auctioned for uh, Malaria No More, which is a charity uh, based in New York. So occasionally, yeah, we auction these glass sculptures and raise some money for charity. That's, so that's a good thing as well. I think, um, oh, one more thing. If you slide, go down the, um, go down the page on the website uh, and go to the Sense of Scale slide bar animation. Hopefully that should work. You can then, you can kind of uh, click on that. Yes, there's a sense of scale. I wonder what you, you managed to find it. Okay. It's up there somewhere. I could see if I can find it. It just gives you a sense of scale about how, how uh, small these viruses really are. I'll see if I can find it for you. We've got it. Oh, you got it. Okay. We've got it, Luke. <laughs> so you can kind of zoom in. What's that? A cocoa bean, I think. So um, I think that that's probably me, really. I think that's that's that's. Uh, I think I'm done. But it's been fun. Uh, Thank you, Luke. Way. It's been and, it's been um, great hearing uh, you. I think I'm happy to answer any questions. If this this could be the tricky bit. Absolutely. I think we just have time for uh, really a couple of questions. Um, does anyone have any questions for Luke? Uh, what I'll do is repeat the question so that he can hear me. Good idea. What music did you play for Sky Orchestra? Oh yeah, well, I'm, uh, I was working with a uh, composer and also working with a sleep psychologist. So we had also had this idea that sounds could be incorporated into people's dreams. So if you say play the sound of a seagull calling, you may end up sort of dreaming about being by the sea. So we had a whole, whole range of sort of ambient sounds and recorded sounds that were played. You know, we didn't really want to uh, upset people or anything like that. The, the music was very uh, sort of respectful of the fact that people are in a very fragile state at that time in the morning. <laughs> and so it was very ambient, very beautiful, uh, and quite, um, quite serene. Really. Any more questions for Luke? Over there to the right, yeah? You? Uh, how long did, did, have you been working on the glass macro, microbiology series? How long did it take you to develop those? Uh, well, yeah, the first artwork was made in 2004. And, um, yeah, and I've just been sort of making uh, occasional ones ever since that time, really. Um, 
each one takes probably about four or five months to make, really, from the inception through the research to the prototyping and then the creation of the final artwork. Was there one thing about that project that you found the most challenging? Um, I'm, I'm still challenging myself all the time. I mean, this the um, and challenging the glass blows all the time as well. Uh, it's um, it also challenges me, challenges me a lot in terms of my understanding of biology. You know, I'm forced to understand how viruses work. Uh, biology is I'm, I'm more of a physicist really. I like the, I'm interested in physics and engineering, so it's quite tricky sometimes for me to get my head around all the different uh, apparatus of a, of a bacteria and what each part does. And it's a lot of fun. But what's interesting is all the, you know, there's lots of uh, scientists have got quite excited by the, by the imagery. So they, I'm on lots of kind of front covers of books and journals and things like that. Um, but this one, is, this one is from Korea. You know, this was just printed a few days ago. <laughs> so it's a, it's a curious world. Um, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but I, you know, it's, I suppose what I've done is by taking out the colour from viruses that you see in newspapers, I've presented myself with another problem. The problem now is that the arcs are incredibly beautiful. So there's this tension now that arises between the beauty of the object and then what it represents. But I suppose that makes, it gives the artwork some interest. It makes it quite sort of potent and powerful. The artworks, you're kind of drawn into the artworks because they're very beautiful. And then when you realize that they're, you know, HIV or something, you're kind of repelled from it slightly. There was some, someone who asked me, who got quite scared, she's saying, well, do, is there actual uh, HIV in there? They thought that if they touched it, they'd be infected, which is <laughs> quite funny. Well, we have it safely under glass, so I don't think we have to worry about that. <laughs> Luke, thank you very much. We wish you were with us to have a glass of wine. We will toast oh. you later, but thank you very much. Like very good. Thank you. Thank you. I think everyone should wave. Wave at him. I could pick you up, actually. I was thinking I could just sort of wear you. Uh, yeah, right. Probably pick you up, Tina. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's been lovely. Thanks very much. Is there, is, are we done? Are there any other questions? Or we are, no, we I are... think we have to move on now. So we'll okay. say have goodbye. Have a lovely day. Take care. And thank you Bye. again. Bye-bye, Luke. Bye. -bye, Luke. Bye.